your finger there in Daniel. In fact, if you want to, you have the game. A finger in Daniel 3 and a finger in Revelation 13. You're on yes. the game. No, I'm not. I am not on you. You might get me, but I'm not. There we go. We are living in precarious and polarizing times with a dangerous crisis of moral and political leadership at the highest levels of our government and of our church. I believe that the soul of our nation and the integrity of our faith is at stake. If never before, it is time for us to be committed followers of Jesus Christ. And we are to be committed to Christ above everything else, above our nationality, our political preferences, our, our race, our, our gender, even our geography. Our identity in Jesus Christ precedes everything else. Amen. Jesus said, people will know that you are my disciples because of the way you love one another. Our personal politics, when that undermines our biblical theology, then we need to readdress our politics. The role of the government is to protect our justice, our peace, and our religious freedom. The role of the church is to change the world through the love and the life of Jesus Christ. And when, the, and when the government undermines the role of the church, we need to remember the words of, John, of um, Martin Luther King Jr. The church must be reminded that she is not the master nor the slave of the state, but is the conscience of the state. Jesus Christ is King of Kings. He is Lord of Lords. He is our master. That is central to the early church theology and needs to be central in our theology. If Jesus is Lord, then Caesar is not, nor any other political affiliation. And if Jesus is Lord, no other authority is absolute. And as Christians, we need to announce Jesus Christ is our final authority. We pray, Thy kingdom come, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Our faith is personal, but never private. Amen. Our faith is not, does not reside just in heaven, but here on earth as well. The question we face is, who is Jesus Christ for us today? And what does our loyalty to Christ as disciples require at this moment in human history. And I can't think of a better biblical example of religious freedom than Daniel chapter 3. So turn with me to verse 1. Nebuchadnezzar, Daniel chapter 3, verse 1. Then Nebuchadnezzar the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits, his breadth thereof six cubits, and he set it in the plain of Dura in the providence of Babylon. Now the Babylonians were creators of a numerical system based on sixes. And we still have remnants of that, 60 seconds in a minute, 60 minutes in an hour, etc. The Babylonians had a 360 day yearly cycle. And they had, their view of the universe was based on 360 degrees. And the Babylonians had 36 gods in their pantheon and who governed all of time and all of space. And Marduk was their number one god. He was the god of the sun. And the Babylonian priest wore a round medallion and was... It was to represent the radiance of the sun. 
And by wearing this medallion, the Chaldean priesthood was invoking the protection of the sun god Marduk. On the reverse side of that medallion was an image of a lion with the body of a snake whose mane was like the sun. It's interesting that in Daniel chapter 7, Babylon is identified as the lion. Now, Nebuchadnezzar had, had just had a recent experience with Daniel in this vision in Daniel chapter 2. And he did not like what he learned from Daniel. He didn't, like, he didn't like the idea that his kingdom would not last forever. He didn't like the idea that there would be successive kingdoms, the silver and the brass. And he wanted his kingdom to be forever. He had a real problem with God. And like many, Nebuchadnezzar rejected God's predictions. He believed that he knew better than God, and he wanted to determine his future for himself. And so Nebuchadnezzar rejected this idea of multiple kingdoms following him as, as revealed in Daniel chapter 2. <laughs> Nebuchadnezzar believed if he could make an image of gold that it could revolutionize, maybe even change the future. But what he didn't realize is that outward forms do not change eternal truth, Amen. nor can it replace true worship. In verse 1, it tells us this image was established in the plain of Dora. And where is the plain of Dora? Well, it turns out that word Dora means wall, and Babylon had two major walls, an interior wall, and they had an exterior wall which, which surrounded the entire city. So most scholars believe that somewhere inside that exterior wall, he set up this image. Nebuchadnezzar could not accept God's will that he was only the head of gold, only a temporary king. He wanted it all for himself. And so he set up this image. 90 feet high, 9 feet wide. In today's terms, it would be about 9 to 10 stories tall, plus a platform, which were commonly used in those days. Notice verse 2. The Nebuchadnezzar, the king, sent and gathered together the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the providence to come to the dedication of the image which Nebuchadnezzar set up. Now why did the king feel he needed a dedication? Remember in early 600 BC, Nebuchadnezzar conquered Jerusalem. In 594, just a few years later, there was a major revolt in his country. In fact, it was hand-to-hand -hand combat, even in the palace, and King Nebuchadnezzar found himself fighting for his own life. As a result, he demanded all of his officers, all of his leaders, all of his politicians to come to this image and to worship it and to show a, as a test of loyalty, partly because of this loyalty that was found in their ranks. My friends, there comes a time when those who follow God must take a stand. We cannot afford to be content with being politically correct. We cannot always flow with the crowd and play it safe. Verse 3, then the princes, the governors, the captains, the judges, the treasurers, the counselors, the sheriffs, and all the rulers of the providence were gathered together into the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then a herald cried out aloud, To you it is commanded, O people, nations, and languages, that at, this, at, that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, the flute, the harp, the sackbut, 
the pulses, the, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. Verse 6, and, though, and whoso followeth not down and worship the same hour, be cast into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. Nebuchadnezzar set up this image. He wanted all his people to worship the sun god Murdoch. In the last days, there will be a power called the beast or the antichrist that will also promote sun sun worship. And the command will be given to worship the image of the beast. Now flip it to Revelation 13 and verse 15. Because Daniel 3 and Revelation 13 parallel each other. Revelation 13, 15. He had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast. What will happen to them? They'll be killed. The central issue of Daniel chapter 3 is worship. Twelve different times that word worship is found in this chapter. The crucial question would be, would all people kneel down and worship Marduk, the sun god? In the last days, that same issue will be raised. In Daniel 3, there is the union of the church and the state of politics and religion. Refusal, refusal not to worship the beast was considered blasphemy against the religion of Babylon and treason against the political authority of Nebuchadnezzar. Amen. In the last days, refusal to worship the image of the beast will, begin, will again be considered blasphemy and treason. Amen. Verse 4, and they worship the dragon. Excuse me, verse 4 of Revelation 13. And they worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worship the beast, saying, Who is like the beast who is able to make war with him? Verse 12. And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them that dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. Nebuchadnezzar's decree to fall down and to worship this beast was, a, was illegitimate. He was beyond his bounds of authority. Because the first four commandments in the Ten Commandments of God's law, only God has the authority to enforce worship, to command worship, to demand worship. God's law belongs to him and him alone. And it describes our loyalty to him. The first four commandments describe the elements of true worship. And the decree to fall down and to worship this image representing Marduk the sun god is a violation of that second commandment. And Nebuchadnezzar is pretty good at getting it wrong. Because in Daniel 3, verse 29, he makes the same mistake of demanding how people will worship. When he says that if you don't worship the true God of Israel, you'll be executed. In the last days, there will be an illegitimate decree that conflicts with God's law. Only this time the issue will be over the fourth commandment. Nebuchadnezzar's decree was universal. It included all peoples, all nations, all languages. In the last days in Revelation 13, that decree will also be universal. Revelation 13, 12. And he exercised all the power of the first beast before him, causing the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. The death decree was proclaimed against all who refused to worship the beast, who worshiped the image of Daniel chapter 3. 
In the last days there will again be a death decree against those who refuse to worship the image of the beast. In Daniel 3, we see a faithful remnant who choose worshiping God over worshiping the sun god. In the last days, there will be a faithful remnant who will choose to worship God and keep His commandments and have the faith of Jesus Christ, even at the risk of their own deaths. In Daniel 3, and Revelation 13, those who accused the remnant before the king were the religious leaders of Babylon and the religious leaders of spiritual Babylon. Now, I know that we don't normally try to identify with Nebuchadnezzar, but I'd like to suggest, and if you hear me out, that we do need to identify with Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 3. Do we not sometimes exalt ourselves beyond what we should? Do we not often act as if matters of destiny are in our hands rather than in God's hands? Do we not draw attention to who we are, to whom we know, and to what we've done? And is not the same pride that's in the heart of this king lurking in our own hearts. So I really want to identify with the three Hebrews. But before I can do that, I need to ask God, who is able to deliver me from my pride, from my arrogance, and from my sin. Who is this God that can deliver me from me? Back to Daniel chapter 3 and verse 7. Therefore, at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the cornet, the flute, sackbut, the palsy, and all kinds of music, all the people of the nations and the languages fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. Verse 8. Wherefore, at that time, Certain Chaldeans came near and accused the Jews. Verse 12. There are certain Jews whom thou hast set over the affairs of the providence of Babylon, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have not regarded thee. They serve not thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. There's two things we're doing here. One is they're, they're exposing Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And, very carefully, they're challenging the king's wisdom. Because he's the one that set these men up. And their accusation against the Hebrews is fourfold. They accuse these three men of ingratitude, disloyalty, disrespect, and disobedience. Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego are going through the time of trouble. The entire world stands up against them. In the last days, God's remnant people will go through a time of trouble and stand alone for God against the world. Those who stand for God in the crisis, whether it is the Hebrew young people or the final remnant, will have to stand alone with God. They were able to do this because their characters, in the time that they were young kids, had been focused on trusting God. Amen. And it's also important to notice that these three young men, they're not the heroes of this story. The true hero is Jesus Christ, Amen. who stands in the fiery furnace with them. And becomes the message of deliverance. Notice chapter 3, verse 14 of Daniel. Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, do not you serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up? The king is trying to reason with these three men and saying, just be politically correct. 
Just worship this God. It's not a big deal. And, and in verse 15, he, he finishes with this question. Who is that God that shall deliver you from my hands? Of the 36 gods that the Babylonians worship, of the 36 gods that Nebuchadnezzar worshipped, including Margaret the sun god, Nebuchadnezzar did not believe any of those gods could protect him from the fire furnace. And just about eight years before this event, Nebuchadnezzar conquers Jerusalem. In his mind, he has defeated the God of Israel. He is more powerful. His God is more powerful than their gods. And their gods can't protect you from this, this terrible fire. So he's asking Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, save your life. Worship the sun god because you're going to be cremated. The stories found in Daniel help us to understand God's sovereignty. God calls us to be faithful to Him. Regardless of our circumstances. And little did Nebuchadnezzar realize that, that he was just clay in the hands of the potter. And before his life ended, he will kneel and bow, not to a golden image, but to the king of the universe. Amen. Verse 16 of Daniel 3. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said unto the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, We are not careful to answer thee in this matter. You see, the contest here, and they understand it, is between Nebuchadnezzar and the God of the universe. And just as God delivered these three Hebrews in the end time, if it is his will, he will deliver us whatever trials come our way, He only calls us to be loyal, to be obedient, to, be, to surrender ourselves to Him, and to worship the God of the universe. These young men prefer death over apostasy. Amen. Their unwavering faith was not the rescue from the fiery furnace. But their trust in God was the great miracle that takes place here. In faith, these Hebrew men stood boldly before the, before the range of this king. And they told the king, their God is able to deliver them from this fire and furnace. But if he chooses not to, they will choose faithfulness. Notice verse 21. These men were bound in their coats, their horse wholesome, their hats, and their outer garments were cast into the midst of the burning, fiery furnace. Verse 22. Therefore, because the king's commandment was urgent and the furnace exceedingly hot, the flame of the fire slew those men who took Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. In verse 23. 